him the praise. Because he's so worthy. Hallelujah. He didn't have to wake us up this morning, but he did. Hallelujah. So we've got a reason to praise him this morning. So let's give him the glory. Hallelujah. Give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Praise God this morning. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing to be in his house again. And I'm going to read. I'm going to read a psalm from a book that's not the psalm this morning. So I'm coming from First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16. I'm starting from 23. And it says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen. His marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. Hallelujah. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. So give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Hallelujah. And it says, bring an offering and come before him and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness this morning. Glory to God. Fear before him all the earth and the world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Now let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. And let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. The Lord reigneth this morning. Glory to God. And then let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord because he cometh to judge the earth. Church, it's spring. It's, it's just, this is just so beautiful. Two more verses. And it says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. And the last verse I'm going to read is 36. And it says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, amen. amen. And praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us praise him. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Father. We praise you this morning.
can't live without your love. I can't move without your love. Without you, I wouldn't be. Amen. Amen. for blessing us once again and just letting us know the reason why we are here. Amen. Today is the, again, the first day of spring, so we're springing forward into a new season. Today we're coming from the book of Philippians, where Paul wrote this to one of the first churches he founded in Macedonia church in Philippi. And Paul was bringing into a new season himself. And I want to share a few verses from chapter 2 of Philippians. Starting at verse 1. Therefore, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look. Not only look, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. The topic for today is being united through putting others before yourself. Hallelujah. Unity by putting others before yourself. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, for the inspiration for the word. I just thank you, Father, for just being in the midst today, Father. I thank you. Now, as I attempt to preach this message, be with me, Lord. Be with me, Father, and be with those listening and viewing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we look at this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he was greeting them, and he let them know about his condition. He also let them know or warned them against false teaching, as he did in his letters to the other churches spread throughout Asia Minor. But if we, as we go to the second chapter of Philippians, we see that word, therefore. And when you see that, you need to back up a little bit to see what it's there for. Amen? <laughs> to see what it is there for. And as we look at the last part of chapter 1, he's letting them know that they need to conduct themselves worthy of being Christians. Amen? The 27th verse of chapter 1, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, and that you stand fast in one spirit and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, 
and not in any way be terrified by your adversaries, which, are, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to be, believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Now Paul was writing this from prison. He wrote this letter, and he's letting them know that even though he is suffering, that he is still has his mind focused on Christ. And he's encouraging them to focus on Christ, striving together for the faith of the gospel in the 27th verse of chapter 1. Then we come to chapter 2, where it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. And we come to this sentence in chapter 2. And we see that word, if, four times in that passage. And what he's doing is presenting a hypothesis to them. And as I, I've looked over this passage for years, and every time I read it, what stuck out to me was the ifs. And then I realized last night, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit works with you. I realized last night why I was so focused on the ifs. You, you see, when I was in college a long time ago, uh, I took a course called Symbolic Logic to fulfill a math requirement. I thought it would be an easy course, but it was no easy course. It was a hard course, but the one thing that I loved about it was the if-then statements in Symbolic Logic. And, and that's why I've been focusing so much on the ifs. Because the ifs come with conditions. So, so let me lay out this if-then statement. If is the hypothesis. It's the, it's the proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence. Let me give you an example. If my sinuses are bothering me, which they are, then pollen is out somewhere. Now, I love the spring, but I don't like the pollen. But an if-then statement says, if this is in you, if these conditions are right, then this is the result that it should have. So therefore, as we look at the ifs, in the first verse of Philippians 2, if there is any consolation in Christ. Now, when we look at that word consolation, we need to think about encouragement or comfort. That's what it really means. Now, now they should have encouragement from being united with Christ. Encouragement comes from the same Greek word that means comforter. And, 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 and when I think about comforter, I think about John 14, 16, when, when Jesus said that I will pray and the Lord will give you another comforter that he might abide with you. Yes. So, so in other words, if therefore if there be any consolation, if there be any encouragement, if there be any comfort in Christ, and I think that's what we have, my brothers and sisters. He also says, if any comfort in love. Do you have comfort in the love we have for each other, the love that we have for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? After all, isn't this what Jesus told us that we needed to have was love? 
Matthew chapter 22, starting at the 37th verse, when the Pharisees came and questioned Jesus, and, and one of them who was a lawyer asked him about the greatest commandment, and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is the first and great commandment. So we need to have comfort from the love of God. The love we have from God and the love we share of God with others. Then I have to look at verse John's letter. 1 John 4, 20, where John says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Amen. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So therefore, if we are a Christian, then we ought to have love. Then that next if, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Do we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Do we have those times? After all, then Jesus did say that he left a comforter with us, as I just recited from John 14. So if that comforter is with us in the form of the Holy Spirit, are we comforted by the Holy Spirit? Does he soothe our emotions during those times when we need somebody and nobody else is around? Do we have fellowship with the Spirit? And fellowship is an intentional word. Fellowship is when we reach out and agree with one another. Fellowship is when we set time apart for the specific purpose of enjoying the company of someone fellowship it's hard to be have fellowship if you stay to yourself all of the time yes we can have fellowship over the phone but there's nothing like having fellowship yeah. coming together with one another I will share with you that my um, family usually meets in a reunion every other year and we've had to put that off twice in the last two years because of the pandemic but we're going to try to have it this summer because we've heard so many of the older family members say we miss the fellowship. Amen. We miss the fellowship. So we're trying our best to have a reunion, a safe reunion in the midst of troubling times. Any fellowship, fellowship is very important to us. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Affection means tenderness. It means compassion. The Holy Spirit will produce within us that concern for members of God's family. Amen? Amen. This is why we have a better sense of empathy than others do. We care for the concerns yeah. Of others. That's why you see commercials. If you watch late night TV like I do, you might see commercials of people pleading for resources, pleading for money, for causes. And, and, and it's targeted at us because they know that we have a sense of empathy. We do not enjoy seeing others in pain and suffering. So unfortunately, not everybody has good motives when they do that. But it's that affection that we have as saints that separates us from a world that says, I'm in it for me. It's all about me, 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 me. So what Paul is saying in this, in this hypothesis, in this initial statement, this if statement, therefore, if, there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, then, and this is that if then statement, as we look at verse 2, 
which is the then or the conclusion, which comes as a result of the hypothesis being true. As we look at that, it says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What Paul is saying is, is if you have all those attributes that I spoke about in verse 1, then make me happy by showing it. Make me happy by living it. Make me happy by doing it. Make me happy. Was the choir saying, saying, if you're happy, say amen. amen. If you're happy. And that's what Paul is saying, fulfill my joy. Make me happy in knowing that my hypothesis statement in verse 1 is real. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, by being on one accord with each other, by, by having the same mind, and that mind is focused on Jesus Christ. Being of like-minded, knowing that even though we are human and we will have disputes, but we know how to resolve those disputes as Christians. We, we know how to do things a different way than the world might teach us how to do them. Be like-minded, having the same love, having the same love. Going back to John 13, yes. verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Yes. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Yes. Being like-minded, having the same love, having the same love. And that's, we are connected through our love of Christ and love with one another. And being on one accord, that one accord is doing the work of Christ here on earth. And being of one mind and one purpose, fulfilling the will of Christ here on earth. So if you are all of those things in verse 1, if you have those attributes, then you make Paul happy. Paul gave it all, amen? And I like to think that we can make Paul happy too today. We can make... Christ happy today. We can make God happy today. And he goes in verse 3, Philippians 2, and says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And this is some practical guidance. Even for us today, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or self-centeredness. Apparently that might have been a problem in the Philippian church. I know it was a problem in some other churches where people got in positions and thought they were high and mighty. But what he is saying is, don't do anything looking out for yourself. Right. This is not a number one. Amen? This is not a number one. Don't do it that way. And, and self-ambitious are conceit. I know the King James uses a word called vain glory. Vain glory, which is vanity, conceitedness. Being empty glory might be a more appropriate way of saying it. They have empty glory, and that might be the root of their selfishness. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem another better than himself. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to share something with you. I've been watching way too much basketball the past couple of weeks. And, you know, usually when, you, when you, I watch a game, I set some time aside. And some games I might watch at the beginning. And when it looks like it gets out of hand, I'll, you know, I'll shut it off and study. Or other games I might tune in when there might be 10 minutes left to see if it's close. And if it's not close, I will tune out again. But it seems like we've had an extraordinary amount of games that have gone down to the last yes. few minutes. And, and as I'm watching, I love to watch March Madness, as it's called, because you have the teams ranked based on what they have demonstrated throughout the season. But when you get to the tournament, each game can be the end of your season. Amen? But, but, but one, one stream I see going through these winning teams, one thing I see that they have in common that they might not be as talented as other teams, but they are not selfish. They are not ambitious or conceited. I even heard a team say yesterday, when asked the question, why are you so much better than you were earlier and earlier in the season? And the answer is because we learn to trust in others. We learned that it's all not all about me. Anytime I want to, I can go out and get my 20 points. But if I can help somebody else get 30 points, and if we win, I'm good with that. And I watch especially the upsets. And I think to myself at the beginning, there is no chance that they will win. But yet they manage to win. Why? Because they're not looking out for themselves. They've learned to trust the ability of their teammates and put the team in the best position to win. You see, every now and then, I know we got some coaches among us, uh, Brother Darius and Conica. I know y'all are coaches, and know, I know y'all can testify to some of this, but every now and then, you've got to take the best player out of the game. Because they're not playing team ball. They're being selfish. They have no assist in their legend ledger. They want to see themselves get the points. They look out in the crowd and see the scouts who have come to look at them. So therefore, they got to play the perfect game. They got to show off all their skills. They got to get to the basket. They got to shake the rim with their dunks. They got to break somebody's ankles when they go around them. They got to show it all. But then if the team does not win, nobody's happy. There are situations in churches today where you don't have team players, where people say, it's all about me. This is my ministry, and nobody else can help or assist me. Only I can do this. I believe we had somebody on Pennsylvania Avenue who had that attitude a few years ago. Only I can do this. Nobody else. But I wish he could read, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let every each esteem others better than himself. And I believe the definition of team, I saw this together. What is it? Uh, uh, each achieve. Um, what's the rest of it? More, yeah. Each achieve more. The teamwork, and I have a friend who says this all the time, teamwork makes the dream work. Amen? Teamwork makes the dream work. 
So that's what Paul is trying to get over to this church. I can't be with you right now. But I know you're going to go through challenging times. I, I know you're going to go through times when you see stuff that is not right. But this is how you need to operate. Without the selfish ambition, with, without the vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And then in verse 4, let each of you look out. Not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. You see, humility is a result of the right relationship with Christ. That's what he's telling them to have. Have humility. Be humble. Quit thinking that it's all about me. Be a team player. You have what it takes. You have the consolation of Christ. You have the comfort of love. You have the fellowship of the Spirit. You have affections and mercy. So therefore, be a team player. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. The guidance, likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time or season. So he may exalt you when the time is right. My brothers and sisters, is this the season to be exalted? Is this the time to be exalted? Have we put in the labor? You know, the last, the last I heard that when the team wins the championship, everybody get rings. Amen? Everybody get trophies. Everybody get their picture taken. Even if you did not play in that game at all. And that's what teamwork is. Being prepared to play when you need to, even though you might never play. And I've used this illustration before years ago. Yeah, it was years ago. When the Carolina Hurricanes won the championship, the world championship, the year was 2006, I believe. And we were fortunate enough to be at that game, game seven, and we got to see it all. And what really impressed me was at the end of the game, after they won, the players who had played carried the trophy around. They had the trophy. But as they skated around the arena with the trophy in their hand, they handed it off to each other. And then after they had it, then the guys who did not play, they got to hold it and hold it up and applause for them because they were part of the team. And after they finished with it, other people who I imagine were managers and, and staff and things like that, they came out and they held the trophy. Now, now, the cameras were off by this time. It was back to regular programming on the network. If you just watched the game, you just saw the people who played. But if you watched after the game, you saw the people who made it possible. You saw all the others who were in the arena. And, and as several people, and we just stood there and clapped and cheered as each person got to hold the trophy and, and do a skate or a walk around with the trophy. And what I thought to myself is this is true teamwork. 
They are not just recognizing the one who made the most gold. They are, are not just recognizing the goalie who prevented the goals. They are not just recognizing those whose names we see in the sports pages all the time. But everybody won when they won. That's how God wants it with us. That's how he wants it with us. He wants us all to win because who gets the glory? God gets the glory with when, when we win. And then that next verse of Philippians 2, 5 is not part of this message, but it connects to why this message is so important. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Jesus. In other words, be like Jesus because he was the example of a humility and selflessness, even, even to the point of dying a death that many of us would not want to be around, even doing it knowing that his disciples would disturb him at that time, even knowing that people would not appreciate him at that time. But why did he do it? Because he did it for us out of love. Yes, he did. Out of love. Out of love. You know, it used to be those bracelets people would wear, WWJD, what would Jesus do? You know, uh, <laughs> I used to jokingly say to some people, I said, how do you know what Jesus would do if you don't know what he did? Amen. You have to know what he did in order to know what he would do. My brothers and sisters, life is full of if-then statements. If you study hard, then you will get good grades. If you do a good job, you will get rewarded, as our parents used to tell us. If you put Christ first, then you will be taken care of. If you trust Jesus, if you trust Jesus, if you love Jesus, he will make those obstacles disappear before you. If you love Jesus, he will make sure that you can take care of everybody. If you love Jesus, he will make sure that that month that is short of money will be enough to get through. If you love Jesus, if you, uh, if you listen to him, if you try to be like Jesus, we can all be a team together, united, achieving much more than we can do on an individual basis. I heard another coach say one time, he said, your hand has five fingers. You hold your fingers like this and try to fight somebody, you're going to get hurt. But if you close those fingers together, they are united into a fist that can break boards if you know how to do the right way. What he was saying is the unity that comes in togetherness, the unity and the power and strength that we need to get through this life and do what we need to do comes through that sense of togetherness, that sense of unity, that sense of knowing who we are and whose we are and knowing that God will take care of us. This is a message of encouragement today. Just as Paul meant it for the church in Philippi, I got to believe somebody needed to hear that today. Or just to reaffirm that together we can achieve much. Together we can do that. Individually, not so much. Individually, we might get the acclaim. But what are we doing for Christ? God bless you. God bless you. Unity. Unity. Through putting others first before ourselves. Amen.